Yeah, I meant like the two guys. I gotcha. All right. Welcome to episode 51 of our very own special show. We have yet another special show. Tonight we're sitting down with Justin Pearson. And Justin Pearson is well known. I think that if you stumbled on upon this uh, YouTube video, you know who he is. So he knows needs no introduction. But we're going to introduce you anyway. Cool. You played in a lot of bands. Swing Kids is one that comes to mind that's influential. And then The Locust. Fast forward and today... You're playing in a band called Retox that has made quite a name for itself and is making waves in the punk scene generally, I think. And uh, you're also an author now. You authored the book, um, oh, Graveyard <laughs> from the of the Arousal Industry. Yeah, that's good. Close. That's what good. is it? From the Graveyard of the Arousal. Industry. From the Graveyard of the Arousal Industry. I wanted to, I wanted to write that down before then. And uh, alongside, uh, from the graveyard of the arousal industry, you also run... That's my dog. <laughs> that's Gigi. That's Gigi. Hey, girl. You also run 31G Records. Uh-huh. So thanks for sitting down with us, uh, Justin. Yeah, and you uh, serve libations as well, so you're a busy man. So thank you uh-huh. very much for taking the time. I think uh, uh, a, good, a good starting point would be, what would you want to talk about if two kids came over to your house to do an interview? Uh, the guys outside drag racing, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know, we can start with that because I, I do want to, Je- Justin, JP, I noticed you were called what, JP. Whatever, can we yeah. do that yeah. since we got two Justins? Yeah. Um, has a super fucking fascinating journey, I guess, to get to this point. But, but starting at this point, we are in Barrio Logan, which is an up and coming community in San Diego. It's outside. already been here. <laughs> That's such a weird whitewashed term. Yeah, it's so gentrified. Um, it's a it's an awesome community that's been here. It's been a, a stopping ground for me for a while. Yeah. No, I mean, it's definitely, it's a, yeah, it's, it's, it's up and coming in the whitewash sense that yeah. white folks are kind of starting to move in over the last few years. I, at one point, was like really trying to get enough money together to buy a little house over here, like on the other side of twenty or other side of ninety four from twenty fifth, uh-huh. kind of, and uh, wasn't able to put it together. And now everything's kind of gone up a bit. But yeah, so we are in Barrio Logan, a colorful neighborhood. We got guys drag racing three up yeah. on a tiny little street, yeah. and it was like a ninety four Crown Vic and like a Buick with Saber and a truck. So that was awesome, and they were all going pretty slow. <laughs> so it was like a nice. Uh-huh kind of downhole drag race. Uh, what else do you see? I mean, like you said, you got some interesting neighbors. It's a good community. I see, it. it's weird. I'll see like a lot of punks every now and then, a lot of skaters and like, like younger, like kind of skate rats, but I'll always trip out, like see these kids ride by and I'll be like, you know, I'll, I'll like notice like a, like a filth patch or like a nausea shirt or something. I'll be like, oh, you know, like what's up or whatever. And like, or like I'll see like younger Latino boys, like gay boys and stuff, and I'm like, this is crazy. You know, you think like the ghetto, and you think of one thing, but it's actually very uh, multifaceted. And you know, I mean, I can walk my dog to the to the bay, and there's water right there, and there and there's always families, and and it's really funny because, um, I mean, I guess by de- by definition, I'm Caucasian. Uh, I, I would consider myself a mutt or something, but when I walk over to the, the park that's uh, right, not it's not Chicano Park, but it's past it. Oh, past um, it by the water. Yeah, um, I, it's always like pretty chill families or like, you know, like homeless people will be sleeping, you know, under the tree or something. But there's this, occasionally there's all these white people and they have this sound system and it's sort of like this weird rave and they're wasted and it's, um, it's a drag. Uh, just, <laughs> not because they're white, but I'm just like, you guys are kind of embarrassing. Like you probably shouldn't do that. Like, <laughs> just screaming and sh- just kind of garbage that happens and uh, like kind of taking advantage of this area that's kind of self police like where there's not a whole lot of regulations yeah. so no one's going to come and say you're yeah. too loud or you're too drunk because everyone else has already you know yeah. surpassed those limits or whatever are there any places to go see shows around here yeah yeah roots factory is down here and there's um, a bunch of like kind of weird spaces down on um like uh logan and uh, national, I think, or maybe it's not national, but down there, right, right past, I guess, a little bit towards downtown on the opposite side of Cesar Chavez, there's all these little warehouses and galleries and stuff. It's pretty cool. Oh yeah, are they kind of taking the place of 500 avocado at all? <laughs> I don't know if it's the same thing necessarily because that was like, I mean, it, it actually Golden Hill in in the in like the early or late 90s, early 2000s was a lot like Barrio Logan is now. So that's yeah. sort of why I think. At least why I feel like this is more somewhere where I, I feel comfortable than Golden Hill because 
now I don't think Golden Hills is it's definitely not the same as it was when I moved there and and you know it kind of there was this sort of element of uh, not like lawlessness but like self governing and, and and more of like a communal sense you know and now I feel like in Golden Hill it's it's just changed too much so there is that that aspect but I also feel like I'm I'm also a, a little bit older and I don't I don't necessarily want to have a house that has you know 12 roommates and we have parties and 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 bands playing and staying there and stuff you know now it's I, I think I kind of like narrowed it down to something more mellow well the yeah. place is spick span so I wouldn't want to bring 12 dudes in here because the place <laughs> looks fantastic Ban, thank you bands always do stay here though but usually it's my bandmates or one band or something you know but back in the back in the day like in Golden Hill it'd be all five bands would just crash there you know and they'd, they'd wake up and it'd just smell like you know, pee and beer and stuff, and it was kind of gross. And people would write on the walls and shit like that, and they, I wouldn't let that fly here. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't either. This is way too nice to let that fly. So you, uh, you, there is a bunch of crap on the wall though. <laughs> you were around in San Diego during a pretty uh, influential time uh, for music generally, especially with San Diego's influence. Um, you came to San Diego in the mid '80s, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't have been, I mean, you're 38 now, right? So you're 40. Yeah. I, I was 12 when I moved here. Okay. I was going to say, you couldn't have been that old. Yeah. Okay. okay. So where did you um, where did you live when you came out here? I, I was in Phoenix before, and I moved to Claremont. And that's where my mom and I moved to, Claremont. And I, and I grew up there for a while. And then she kicked me out on 16, and I, I lived in different areas, Hillcrest and Pacific Beach. And then um, and then eventually, by the time I was 19, I moved to Golden Hill. And so I've, I've been in Golden Hill for most of the time. Okay. In that time, uh, in starting in the '90s, who were like some of the most influential people uh, for you, either personally or just from afar? There were a lot of bands in San Diego during that time that really, I think, in a lot of ways, influenced punk rock or sure. sort of post-hardcore. Well, that's a, it's such a weird thing because this this comes up occasionally in in interviews and in discussions about San Diego and and art and culture because I feel like when it, like for me personally, even when I moved to San Diego. I, you know, I, I, the, the, the people that I sort of looked up to or my, uh, my peers that were a, a bit older than me that I, that I think kind of like helped maybe s sort of pave a way were, were like John Reese and, 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 uh, and, you know, even like, um, referencing like, uh, that, uh, like the hot, hot snake show and the J-Hook show and stuff, but like, you know, like Garwood was, um, in this band Fishwife and I would go, you know, like my first band struggle played with Fishwife and, um, you know, I, I think like it was a very eclectic mix because we had you know we had like pitchfork and and fishwife and then we had like the hardcore straight edge people like amenity and you know knowing tim gonzalez and and mike down and all these other people and then matt anderson from heroin so it was sort of like this eclectic mix of genres and styles and even um you know like some of the black heart guys like i knew all them too from all their previous bands from out pilot yeah and and, and everyone kind of just got along and 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 everyone was accepted and everyone um, you know, did everything together, you know, so it wasn't like these different scenes. I mean, there was different scenes to some extent, but for the most part, it was a huge collective or a huge, you know, mix of just like different kinds of styles and people. And I think most of the bands you named, if you took them on an individual basis, each one of those bands would kind of be hard to pin down to a category. Sure. You know, and I, and I think... I, I don't know, I, won't, I wouldn't say that's a downfall of, of the San Diego music scene, but I think maybe it was a contributing part to San Diego, never really burgeoning maybe the way other cities did, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I kind of, I kind of personally like the way the San, like, I don't know, in a way I, I do have a lot of friends and bands that bemoan like getting stage time here and kind of a lack of like a, a true scene. But then at the same time, like, it's kind of cool that the San Diego sound was it was kind of this hard sound coming out of San Diego, which is cool, but it was all over the place. Like, it, it was a hard sound to pin down, and I feel like there was a lot of stuff going on. I mean, to just say that in 1994, The Locust had an album out, right? Isn't that when your first album came out? 94, 95, maybe. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, at the same time, you know, you got, like, a Rocket from the Crypt album out or something, you uh -huh. know? And they're still almost kind of considered maybe two sides of the same San Diego coin, but I mean, stylistically, pretty fucking far apart. I agree, but I mean, maybe from Rocket, but Drive It Jehu was a huge influence, and, and I think um, that that sound was definitely something that, I don't know if it like consciously influenced 
let's say the locust per, per se, but it definitely influenced me. And I and I and and uh, the, um, I mean anything from the the way the songs are written to the to the sound, you know. And but and I wouldn't say like oh you know, Jehu or Rocket or something is an aggressive band, but it is there is an aggressive element to it where like if you would have taken like um, the equivalent to that. Jehu or Rocket or something and, and placed it in another scene in another city it might not have been as like you know as I don't know what the like I don't want to say aggressive but it might not have been as, as like it, w it wouldn't have had the same kind of grit you know and I feel like I feel like here we have that element everybody had that element in, in, in any kind of style even if you listen to like Three Mile Pilot stuff I mean it was still pretty like evil you know and and and, and very punctual and, and demanding in, in a sense you know and and i think um i think that's an important element that i a lot of other cities lack and i'm not faulting anyone for that but i think a lot of it is that like it's not accepting here to do something that's not mass marketable or something i don't even want to say that because you know i just feel like for the most part we just we don't we're not los angeles we're not we're not new york you know we don't have like we're not seattle even we don't have like it, we don't have it easy so so everyone was like what's this come together you know like you're you're into weird shit and you're into weird shit let's just do this together and we'll, it's like power and numbers or how, whatever they say you know and so I feel like that was kind of that was like the basic structure of it okay you um said a couple things during that right there where you know you mentioned uh, punctual and demanding and I think I wouldn't have came up with those words if somebody asked me to describe the locust, but I think that's a pretty apt description of your guys' music. The time signatures are crazy. It's frantic. I mean, quite honestly, when I was in high school and kind of feeling out my like musical threads of kind of where I wanted to go, like I was turned on to the locust and was like immediately like this is way too fucking much for me. Like at the time, like I, I couldn't fucking handle it. Like I'll be up, I, I wasn't ready. You know, I don't think like, I don't think the musical palette was there. I was just coming off of Green Day and Bad Religion at the time, probably, you know, like that was kind of where I was at as far as getting my face melted off or whatever, like as far as like what I was able to, to, you know, it was like the first time you eat fucking jalapenos or something. That shit's spicy <laughs> as fuck. Like, I just couldn't do it. Like it was, it was way too much for me. But now, like, I can go back and listen to that album, and now I'm just, like, like constantly, like, weird little head twitches, like, listening for, like, all the changes sure. and shit, you know? So I've come to appreciate it a lot more, I guess, and I don't, I don't even know where I was going with that. But, I mean, it it's not an easy band for everybody to get into. Oh, yeah. Well, it's such, I mean, we could go on forever about all these different elements because I feel like, not that, like, we were the most original band, but we were sort of ahead of the curve, you know, because now I think if the Locust was to start, it'd be a lot easier because, you know, when we did start, we were like, what are we doing? People don't really know what the hell was going on. And I don't even think we really knew what the hell was going on, but we were doing what we did for, you know, for whatever reasons, we were very influenced by bands like Crossed Out, which is a band from Encinitas from the uh, early 90s, and then bands like Devo, and we're like, let's just mix these two things together, and no one else has done that, and it was like a weird thing, and it, and it became this, you know, I mean, for the most part, those are like our two main reference points. And then so we did this thing and it was in it and some people you know like rocket was like dude come on tour with us we're like oh my god this is gonna be a really bad idea let's totally do that <laughs> yeah. and, and, it, and it was funny you know and the same with the yeah, yeah, so it's like oh you know you like and, you know and, and uh, to the outsider it might seem like oh the novelty weirdo like circusy you know bug band can open for us but they were like dude this is the jam come on tour with us and then their fans were like fuck you guys you know, like, we don't like you bringing them, and we don't like them being here. But it was like, this is how we do it, you know, this is... And, and, it's, and going and back, you know, to, to Rocket and John and stuff like that, that was definitely, like, this sort of, you know, center point, you know? And it, I mean, even, like, when I was first starting playing music, 15, I, I joined this band called Brain Tourniquet, and, uh, and Gravity Records put out the first... I think it was the first Gravity release. It was a split cassette with this band called Slug, and, and Rick Froberg was in that band. I, I believe he played guitar in it. So, um, you know, I mean, it's like, that's, all that stuff, you know, it branches off, but the roots all come down to San Diego, it all, it's all the same. On um, the way down here, Ryan and I were talking about the Locust in particular, and we mentioned that it was more like art than a lot of the music out there, in a way. Um, I guess kind of like beyond music, in a sense. Can you kind of relate to that, or did that come yeah. across in some way? Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of it was, 
it wasn't like we were redefining music, but we weren't using musical elements, you know, it was like, uh, it was very percussive and it was very, um, just, I don't know, harnessing other forms of energy instead of like, hey, this is the wrong chord progression, you know, or having everybody have a ton of effects and, and we're all playing, you know, this, the same note, but like, it's not coming out that note, you know, and we're like, oh, whatever, it sounds cool, you know, and it, these weird like atonal sort of sounds that I think, you know, to someone who's classically trained, you know, we would just get an F minus, like, oh, that's totally wrong, you know, but like to us, because it's like, it's not limiting yourself in these parameters of what is musically acceptable. It's like, it's beyond that. It's like, well, it's still, I mean, music can be like, you know, that, oh, that's music, or that's just me clapping, you know? It's, so you could think like, whatever, you know, like I could scream and then that could be musical or it could just be like some asshole screaming. So it, we just did whatever we thought we wanted to do. <laughs> whatever the guitar or anything else would let you do, I guess. <laughs> yeah, or what they wouldn't let us do, you know, <laughs> we still try to do it. How was it uh, going from guitar originally then to bass? It's not usually, I think, a transition. I barely play guitar. I mean, I, 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 I learned like only a few songs on guitar, and then I did. I played in this like weird industrial project for a little while on guitar, and it just wasn't, wasn't my instrument. So. Do you have any uh, like <coughs> bass players that you look up to, either within the scene, within the punk rock, or that, or loud rock, or not? When I was younger and I discovered No Means No, that was like hands down the, the main bass player because I feel like the way that they all wrote music, it wasn't like, oh, the bassist is gonna play these riffs and it'll kind of like lay under there with the guitar, right. you know, it was its own instrument. And I feel like that was definitely something that I focused on, you know, and, and I was really into No Means No, and then by the, you know, by the time I really started becoming, uh, I mean, playing like for real in a band, uh, I was 15, and, you know, I play with like Man is the Bastard and they just had two bass players. And so it became like its own instrument. It wasn't like, oh, you're the bass player and you're kind of like the backbone of the guitar riffs. You know, it was like, no, 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 you're going to play this stuff and it's going to be the bass line. You know, it's going to be like its own thing. You know, and even now, or even still to this day, a lot of people will hear, you know, Locust stuff and be like, that keyboard's so rad or that synth line's so rad. Like, oh, that's guitar. Oh, that's bass. You know, it's because we would try to hide, you know, um, not hide, but disguise. Like, oh, this isn't this isn't the bass guitar. This is like, there's all these effects in it, and you know, even like buying like two of the same pedal and running an effect into the effect again to get it even more fucked up. You know, um, just so it's not recognizable. You know, and so, and, and it still is like, read. I mean, I don't, don't want to say like redefining music. I feel like in the past I've said that kind of stuff, like oh, I'm destroying music or re. It's like, well, that's just stupid for me to even say that. But but to kind of like reinvent it for myself, you know? You're kind of like forcing music's hand. It's like, here's this. Well, maybe, but I feel like music theory is like, here you go, this is the music theory. These are, this is, these are the parameters. And I'm like, I don't know, I feel like we could step outside that, you know? I I can see, I mean, like, the, you know, at the, you know, I, I can see you're kind of running the line, like, you don't want to sound pompous, but you want to be kind of honest about how you're feeling. But like, I would say that any band that is just kind of following the sound that they want to make and saying fuck all to convention, I guess, is genuinely, in a way, reinventing music. Because it, it, you would, in theory, it couldn't have been done before. Like, so if you're doing the exact feeling that's coming out of you, there isn't any way it can be trite, I guess, unless you're trite or like, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Or if you're, if you're doing something experimental, you're re, Inventing music, I guess. That's my opinion. Um, uh, if you're doing something experimental, you're doing you're you're reinventing music in, in a sense. So I feel like. <laughs> hi. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, so uh, it's when I got like a good example. Going back to the Drive J thing, I'll reference this. Drive J is a perfect example. When I was a little kid, when I was 13 or 14, whenever the first um, J Who record came out, I remember buying it. And listening to the vinyl, and I, and I couldn't believe, I was like, what is that? Like, how are they doing that with the guitar? Like, that is so crazy. It sounds like a keyboard, and there's so much tension in the in the song, or in the sounds, you know. And, and I, so I was automatically drawn towards that. And I said, this is crazy. It's weird. They reinvented something. I don't know what it is. I didn't even understand it, but I was like, this is the sh this is the shit. And then so, 
that record was one of the, is, is hands down one of my favorite all time records. And so, fast forward to what, a week ago when they played yeah. in San Diego with the organ player, um, who who falls in the parameter of like cl- of like classically trained, or like oh, she's a legitimate musician, so she's playing along with them. And I'm, and I'm, of course, she's I could. A doctor. I know. She, yeah, I was so <laughs> impressed. That's legit. And there's so many impressive elements because they invited her to play, and and it was a legendary thing. It was somebody who's a very respected musician playing with them, and and the and the platform was um, this free thing for San Diego, and so many people showed up, and it was like, it was just, the whole thing was like going to church. It was like a religious experience, you know. And and but I would, and I couldn't hear a lot of what she was playing because the the band was loud, you know. But I was watching her, you know, and I could see from behind her, so see her playing along, and, and there, you know, there's these parts where she just lays her hand down in all these notes, and I'm like, that's the jam, you know, because like that, you know, like, do you think like in uh, like uh, you know the London Symphony Orchestra or someone would be like, that's cool, yeah, well, just, yeah, like, yeah. just like just like have you know have a seat, and, I, and so I was like, dude, that's it, because she gets it, you know, and I could kind of like, you know, and a lot of people. And I and I, I struggle with this because I want to just you know rock out like yeah this is the fucking cool shit. But to me I'm like all right I'm gonna just I have to watch this I have to study this and I can see this the dialogue between her and John Reese without even speaking words. Yeah. It's like they're communicating on another level that doesn't that de- re- that doesn't need language you know and and they're speaking to each other and they're they're redefining language they're redefining uh, music and they're communicating to each other and they're communicating to four thousand people out there. Yeah, and I mean, that was a real obvious communication between the two of them. Like, you could see John, like, c- c- walking over, and her kind of light up, and then, like, just... Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's so energy much that's feeding it, yeah. off each other, yeah. and it was... And the same thing, like, you know, and, and, I, and I, would, uh, I would always find those elements and, and, and really need to, like, understand those. And, and it got to the point, to, like, in The Locust, when we were playing, uh, you know, like, I think... I don't know what point it was, but... Maybe around when we released um, Plague Soundscapes, we started setting up in a, in a line, and so Gabe would be right up front, and it would be Gabe up front, mainly because we were opening for bands like the Yeah Yeah Yeahs and Rock from the Crypt, and so there was not a lot of room, and we would have to figure out how to set up, and we don't have a front person, and, and so we could do these things, so we'd have this line of, of, of us setting up, and it'd be um, the drums, and then Joey would be over here, and Bobby and I would be next to each other, and I think, um, I don't know, like, I don't really, I'm not really sure if that's even like the smart thing to do, but for us it, it felt natural, you know, and we had this line, and it would all be like peripheral vision. We had masks on too, so it would be the peripheral vision of when, when you see Gabe's hand coming down to grab these to grab these split second changes, you know, and, um, but even with that, you know, you're limiting what you're, what you're seeing. You're limiting your, commu- your, your, your uh, um, ability to communicate with someone, and it's all about this sort of underlying energy, and I don't even know how to... I mean, I'm I'm an atheist, so I wouldn't even say it's like a religious thing, but it was that we were we were communicating on another level, a spiritual level. Or Carl something. Jung uh, talked about this sort of stuff in the 20th century. He's a German scientist yeah, or yeah. whatever, and he uh, talked about collective unconscious. Totally. That, that there was some. And yep. just, I think a lot of people have kind of stumbled on that information. There's a good anecdote he tells where he had a patient in his in his hospital at the time who I believe was schizophrenic. And one day, Carl Jung walked up to him as the patient was kind of peering out the window, and he was looking at the sun, and he was going back and forth like this, and Carl Jung was like, what are you doing? Why are you, like, swaying back and forth? And the guy was like, well, the sun's penis. Every single time I move back or forth this way, it moves, and then there's, like, this breeze that comes. And Carl Jung was like, all right, buddy, sure thing. (laughs) And uh, he went back, and, like, uh, not long later, he was uh, reading some stuff, and he came across this old, like, Persian story which is basically just telling of the sun's penis and how when you move to one side it would move and then this breeze would come over huh. and the only way he could come the only way he figured this guy would have ever come across that story was through some sort of he was be, he was able to tune in to some sort of collective, collective unconscious, unconscious yeah. probably because he was already loony he was a little <laughs> yeah maybe that does help I feel like it can definitely help I mean unless you're super good at meditation and stuff like that or you're I mean fucking mushrooms helps like you know there's things that like and maybe being great like you know you see a lot of like high level kind of side effects of like people that have autism or sometimes people yeah. that are schizophrenic where they're you know whether or, you know the u- word used to be an idiot savant obviously that's not the proper nomenclature these days but I mean there's a lot of savant weird stuff that happens man I mean I'm a I consider myself like a fucking like hardcore agnostic like I just feel like I don't know anything like I feel like yeah. that's my main line, like on on everything, and 
Yeah, I mean, I'm I, like, I, I think that, you know, naturally when it comes down to like Bibles or scripts, like man is fallible and this has been changed by man X amount of time. So I have a hard time saying, oh yeah, this is truly fucking some divine thing. But at the same time, you know, I've said it before and I don't, I mean, it's a little bit flippant, but I mean, for all I know, like theoretically, I could die, get somewhere and they should, and they're just like, should have been Mormon. You know, <laughs> yeah, I'd be yeah. like, fuck. Oh, the you worst. Know, like, yeah. I would be so pissed if they said that to me. Yeah, right? I'd be, Mormon out of all of them? I'd be oh. furious. I'd be like, oh, all right, fuck you guys. I didn't want to be here. You know, like, I don't know, but. <laughs> That's kind of one of those things, though, where at least I would be like, I never would have guessed. Yeah. Like, even if I had guessed and been like, ah, I'm going to be Christian just because I might be. They're like, there's a yeah. weird sect in Laos that like worships caterpillars and that's it that was yeah. it like you guys all yeah. missed the boat you yeah. know and be like fuck I, I didn't even know like nobody proselytized that to me I, I but that, that maybe that maybe you can use that metaphorically speaking because you know you have all these we don't even know you have these human parameters and we're only thinking like oh there's there's this life and then there's the heavens or there's this life and then there's nothing we don't know I mean we only use a percentage of our brain, small percentage of our brain there could be all kinds of shit that we can't even wrap our minds around. So, like, if someone's going to tell me, like, if you're going to use two of those pedals, that's wrong. That makes the weirdest note. It's not even a note. I'd be like, fuck you, because you didn't wrap your head around it. Like, it sounds awesome. It sounds like a pickup truck, you know, being driven into a wall. Like, that's cool. Like, I want to hear that in a weird repetition and put that to a BPM of some sort and, and scream over it. There you go. That's music. You know? It's like what really shone through during the Drive Lake Jehu performance was some of like John Reese's bird calls with the guitar. Oh, right dude, now. that's it. But that's his signature sound. You yeah. know, the, the hitting your pickup or hitting your uh, your the, the tubes in the amp with, with the pickup and it makes that 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 tone. That tone. I mean, I remember the, the first Locust album or the we did a Locust Man's the Bastard Bastard Noise split ten inch and I ripped that shit off. I have an SVT amp and I just stick my bass up against my head and it made the chirping noise. I was like, ah, there's that noise. <laughs> yes. You know? But the, at the, in, in reference to that, also at the same exact time, when Man as the Bastard was playing, they had all these oscillators making those same chirping noises with their weird noise gear that they would build. Same thing, like, doo -doo -doo -doo, you know, like they'd have whole songs just like shit like that. So that's why I was like, oh, this stuff and then this stuff, it all makes sense, you know? Like all these genres make sense to me. Mm -hmm. What sort of uh, recording techniques are you more, I guess, uh, pulled to these days? We're talking about all these sounds. I think that with new recordings, people recording for playlists, a lot of digital aspects, that something's been lost. What, do you agree with that? or? I don't know because for me, I've always struggled. Well, for one, most of the recordings that I've done have been very limited, rushed, even when everything's been rushed. Like, oh, you have like, here's a hundred bucks, go <laughs> record an album, you know, it's like, oh, shit. Or, or even like when the Locust um, did our first record on Anti, we had a really nice recording budget. We still ran out of time, you know. And I remember like um, just a couple little, you know, flusters here and there. Like, ah, oh, if we had like one more day, you know, we could have made that different or whatever. And you know, and even with that, it's like you're still learning. You know, after you're done with the recording, no matter what kind of money you have or what kind of a like, you know, oh, I could use whatever kind of gear I can get my hands on, whatever you have access to. You still learn from whatever you have and you still go to the next level, you know, and that's, that's it. So, I mean, I think like, you know, there are like analog purists and then there's like, I don't know, there's all these purists or all these theories and I, I feel like, well, whatever I have the, my, the ability to use, I will utilize it and, and that, and I'll do my best, you know, and, 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 it, and if it's garbage, I won't, I will just say it's garbage or I'll say, oh, that's acceptable or I'll say, oh, that's badass. Let's do this, you know, like, so, I mean, I, I think you're kind of an asshole if you're like if you're if you're if you're some sort of purist or elitist. Not an asshole, but you. That means you have the ability to call all the shots. And I feel, I just I mean, never. I mean, I'm. That's a class situation for me too because I feel like I, I don't have the money to to go and like record on anything that I damn well please. You know, I have to I have to work within a means, and that's and the outcome is hopefully cool. You know. Yeah. I mean, like, to me, like, especially the people from the outside that are, like, curious or, like, I, I mean, for me, I wouldn't pretend to be, I mean, I, I have no musical talent, and I've never been in a band, so it would be silly for me to kind of make claims like that, I feel. But any time I feel like somebody does that, whether they're an analog or digital or whatever, like, you're just choosing a side, and it doesn't seem to make sense to me to choose that side. Yeah. Because you, it's just a self-limiting prophecy. Like, I, I mean, I don't know. Well, analog is nice, but it's expensive, and it, and I think that digital recording techniques are becoming better and better, and, and it's harder to tell the difference, you know. But there are certain elements to um, t 
to analog, it, it is warmer. It is, it, it, there is a different, a different sound to it. But at the same time, it's like, well, you can go the analog route or you can go the digital route and you have more time and you have, you have more, more, you can, you know, allocate your funds to having more time to kind of redo things. So you, you know, you perform better or whatever. Cause I mean, I, I know when, when we were doing uh, Plague Soundscapes, which was all analog, there, there was this huge pile of tape being cut, you know, we're like, oh my God, this is crazy. It's expensive. You know, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm thinking, like, i got to play this perfectly every time because I don't have the, uh, the finances to fuck it, up, uh, fuck it up or, like, to try to do it better another time. You know, this is, like, my only chance. Or, you know, we're, like, un under the gun, you know. And so I figured, like, you know, the record came out how it was, and I, I think, for the most part, it's, it's flawless on, 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 our, on our behalf. But at the same time, it's like, well, if we would have went digital and, and, and the producer said, you have another two weeks, it's like, oh, my God, we could have really done something else, you know? But then at the same time, you could have wrote more music or just, you know, yeah, I don't you know. know or something. I mean, I mean, yeah, because we were rushed. It was only 20 minutes worth of music. You know, like, if you had another two weeks, you could have, like, wrote another song or something or another six songs or something. Yeah, I mean, I, I shoot a lot of photography and... I you know I don't I would I would love to shoot film well. yeah like shooting films rad like I would love to shoot one twenty roll film like I cause like you know or four by five or something if I can afford a four by five camera or bigger if I got a field camera or something but it it's a financial issue at some point too and I remember like <laughs> every shot you're like oh, God, yeah. this better be good and I, yeah I remember taking classes and you're like developing film and, and there's there there's you know there is something to be said for the consequences of it and that kind of heightened. Uh, just sense of importance to each shot but then at the same time man it fucking makes me so happy to have like a 64 gig card and fire off fucking 5,000 shots yeah. go to my kids soccer game go to the beach yeah. do whatever and at the end of the day I can pull 10 really good shots yeah. out of there you know like so that's amazing that's and I think that's badass because then there's the chance of capturing that one element that you needed to capture but I'll say this music and and film you're you, now we have an oversaturation because everyone's just like Here's a selfie. Here's a selfie every day of my of my life. It's like fuck that. I don't care what you know. I don't. I don't want to see what your pizza looks like. I don't care about shit or like music. It's like everyone just makes these, you know, sort of. I mean, demos with little to no effort, and then they think like we should be signed. You know, it's like, yeah. dude. I remember like touring like a motherfucker and and like and like, you know, almost dying before <laughs> anyone even like gave a shit. I, before I could even sell a single T-shirt, let alone make a record and have like it be in this sea of internet for anyone to have access to. I mean, do you think, to play kind of devil's advocate to that, do you think that the super saturation is, is almost elevating it in certain ways because there's more of a struggle almost to be heard over the cacophony of bullshit? Yeah, that's the thing is, I mean, I'm going to bow out and say, like, I don't think, it's the same with the, you know, like, a, like a recording tech, yeah. tech uh, you know, a, ability or whatever, or like theory. I, I feel like with photos or music, it's just, I mean, maybe it is better now, or maybe it is worse. I don't know. The point is, I feel like there's like this shift, and there's gonna always be these shifts. So it, we're shifting into some into something. You know, at some point. I mean, I, I think like, you know, to me, like uh, my poor friends, like using broken equipment, um, made weird sounds, and then all of a sudden you're like, dude, because they didn't have the ability to buy rad gear, they made all this fucked up weird shit that sounded crazy, and that changed the way I perceive things so you know you could say like that's cool you know but yeah. now it's like everyone has the ability to do whatever they want you know you could everyone has a phone with a camera and so I feel like I don't know I mean I, I don't want to sound like a jerk or like an old person or something because you know even at that Jehu show I just remember like standing next to the, I, stand, I was standing next to this guy I didn't know he was hilarious because right in front of him was this dude that was filming them and it was like totally in his view and it's like and, and I could see what he was filming you know on his camera I'm like that looks like shit and the guy's like dude are you gonna film the whole show and he goes yeah and I, and I <laughs> and I laughed I was like this is really amusing to me and then I said to the guy like you know there's gonna be a, like 10 better ones on the internet if you just like that'll come up right away like if you search it tomorrow morning like are you gonna go home and edit that and like fix yeah. the sound and put it out there for the world it to looked see like, it? it looked like shit I guarantee you and it was like you know, like, I don't even know, I don't, I'm not like a, again, I'm not like, oh, iPhone 6 or 7, you know, I mean, it was like some shitty, like, Samsung, I don't even know, it's like, and it just looked like garbage, anyway, but it, you know, it's like, we all were looking at his arms, and I was like, dude, just put your fucking arms down, and dig this shit, because the world, there's a lot of people around the whole planet that want to see this, and hear this, and experience it, and experience it as, like, 
human being should. Like, put your fucking camera down. It doesn't matter. It's garbage, you know? So, I mean, you could say that about, like... Yeah. It, but, I mean, I've had people say that to me. Dude, your band sucks. You should stop. <laughs> and, it, you know... I mean, Scott Bartoloni from Heroin said that to me when I was in Struggle, and I was like, fuck, man, like, that sucks, because I kind of like my band. But And then it was really <laughs> crazy, time. because our guitar player at the time quit, because this guy from Heroin said, like, your band sucks. Like, and it was that much of a blow? He something? was just like, yeah, maybe it does, you know? And so he kind of stopped playing with us. You know, and it was it was a weird thing to think yeah. about. So, I mean, There's maybe, a big difference between uh, camera phone Yeah, and, I know, and, like, but maybe that out. guy that I told, the, or the other guy, I didn't even say it to him, I just kind of laughed, but, like, the guy that said, put your fucking arms down, you know, maybe that guy was going to be the next, uh, I don't know, Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> 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 uh, have, you, have you ever worked with any uh, record producers that you've just been like, wow, this is some next level shit? I've not worked with very many record producers, yeah. and the people... And it, it, I feel really lucky because the first time I've ever worked with a producer was Alex Newport, and that was with The Locust, and then with some girls. Um, I, I chose them. I said, you guys, we got to like check out this producer. We, can, we have the, the budget to, to have someone do this. I want him to record our record. Because up until that point, all we knew is we would go to a studio, pay a guy to record it, and then we would sit there and we'd all go like to boost this or cut that. And, you know, We would produce it ourselves and just tell the engineer what to do. And, 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 and no disrespect to those people that we hired before that, but I feel like there wasn't that like love put into it. Where mm-hmm. like when we heard Alex Newport, I said, we need to hire him. And for me, I said, you gotta hear this record, this drums, dude, this is the shit. And I was like, all about the drums, like let's get this guy. And, 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 and he did wonders for Gabe's drumming, and, and not for his drumming, but for the, the recording um, technique and, and the way it sounded on the album and so I learned so much on that you know and then I we used him and then I worked with uh, my, my friend Brent Ashbury who did a bunch of stuff did all leather and um, um, and right now is doing the new retox album you know and, I, and, I, and I've learned a lot from him and uh, and even like the previous um, retox album working with um, Chris Rakestraw same same thing it's like I learn all these different things from these different people and I take and I take them and then I have more knowledge and I you know I have the ability to to be a better artist or, um, you know, or to, or to pick who to use at, at that point, you know, I mean, I think the decision to work with Brant on the new Retox album, I mean, we could have used other people, we could have, you know, tried to work on a record with, with Chris Reichstraw again, but I said, oh, I worked with this guy and, you know, all other, like, let's use this and he, I feel like this will be a cool thing, like, you know, I mean, it's it's kind of like this learning process and, and, and what you're exposed to, you know, so. Yeah. Well, uh, so Retox is is on Epitaph. Yes. How has that been? I know the uh, Locust was also on Anti, but how's it been working with Epitaph? It's good. I, I did a lot of stuff with them now. I mean, even the last Sun Girls record was on on Epitaph as well. And um, I love Brett, and I love everyone that works there. is really really good, and I feel like it's a very strong um, you know sort of machine of uh, of, a, of of the business of the music industry. Um, but I but I also know that we don't sell records, and so. Um, I am grateful for um, Brett um, to sign us as like a, as like street cred or something, you know. Uh, well, it definitely uh, is street cred. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't want to sound like that, but it's kind of a joke. But it's the same. At the same time, we're not. There is no way. Like even with the locust, they didn't, they didn't make any money. You're almost like a brand ambassador, you know. Like I don't know. I mean, we struggled with it. The locusts struggled a lot with the, with working with them because of that aspect, because of the brand, and that's why we said we will only be on anti, and and you know, and we and we felt that that was a home for us because to to us we looked at anti and saw Nick Cave and you know um, Tom Waits and all these other artists that we thought we were uh, not you know in that whole San Diego mentality we're like oh we're like them <laughs> like that's our you know because we're not like Pennywise and we're not like refused we're, we're, we're over here yeah so so um but then after, next to top lights yeah <laughs> um it was also from san diego but you know yeah, the, top high, baby. Yeah. but the, so the thing is i feel like uh you know then then when some girls did the record um on epitaph proper and then when retox did it i thought to myself like you know i don't really care what people's perceptions are because we got, the locust got so much shit for being on anti and at the same time, you know, Epitaph put out Dillinger Escape Plan and Converge, 
and those were two fantastic records. And I was like, what the fuck? Why are we getting shit on by everyone? And I was like, we're going to put out our best record yet, and you're going to, like, still just talk shit to us. And so then I was, and then I just said, fuck everyone, I don't really care. And that's why we did the record, uh, the Some Girls and the Retalk stuff. And, you know, and it came down to the fact that, like, I really do respect that label as a business, and, um, and, and they respect us as artists, you know, and I, and I think that's great. And, um, I mean, there's a lot to it, you know. I, I, it's an independent label. They if give I'm us taking the biggest. The, the biggest. I mean, yeah, and they give you 100% artistic freedom, you know. And it's not like, you know, I had, you know, Virgin or Warner Brothers knocking on our door being like, dude, let's put out a record, you know. But you can't say this, you know, and you can't do that. And it's like, well, fuck you. Because these other cats will let us do whatever we want, you know. And, and the thing is, like, I kind of always knew, like, I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm never gonna make any money doing this. And if I do rad, and I'm and I'm not trying to, you know, if I can will some energy from the universe, like, oh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to have a day job or whatever. I want to just do this art stuff. Yeah, I, let's get JP out of his fucking day job, guys. Let's. <laughs> start That's not what I'm saying. Sucked. But no, you know, seriously, I'm not gonna be younger. We and, we want you guys producing more shit. Yeah. And you can't do that if you're working. It's it it is it, it's crazy and it's crazy too because like I look at my bandmates struggle as well too and I'm like dude this is crazy the shit you do for minimum wage you know like this is totally crazy uh, but whatever you know and then you know it's um, it's a strange thing anyhow Epitaph's a great label I respect them and uh, I appreciate them now how um, how is Retalk being received because it not funny haha but funny to me in a way because. If no, if you hadn't heard The Locust, or if you weren't familiar <laughs> with The Locust, I don't think the first thing that pops into your mind when you hear Retox would be approachable, but that's what like popped into my head. I was like, wow, this is like a lot more approachable. And it's like, good, like to me, and I, you know, again, not, not the most educated and not the pigeonhole, but like, it's, it's like good, like straightforward, fucking drivey punk rock. Like, I was just like, yeah, listening to it. Well... Two things. I think, like, um, The Locust, you know, 10 years ago was totally way more absurd than it is now. So so I feel like give give it another 20 years and, and everyone, <laughs> everyone will be playing music like The Locust. You know, every, like, uh, Beyonce will have blast beats and shit, you know, and that's fine. Uh, maybe. Um, so there's that element. But then, there, you know, when you listen to Retox, I mean, it is a little bit <clears throat> more conventional and, and certain te- certain elements... But at the same time, it has that thing that I think, um, you know, Retox isn't necessarily a San Diego-based band, but we're definitely in Southern California, and I feel like there's something to say about all that. So there is that extra thing that I was explaining that I feel like bands like, you know, Rocket had, if, if the equivalent of Rocket in, like, Louisville, I don't know what that band would be, it w- they wouldn't have that grit, you know, wouldn't have that, like, like, that fuck you to them, you know? And I feel like Retox sort of has that element, like... You know, because it's like a, it's like, um, it's like, I hate using metaphors, and I hate using metaphors that are like macho or something, but it's like fucked up in the way like there's a boxing fight, or there's a boxing fight where the dude bites your ear off. That's like kind of like the retox shit. You're like, that was fucked up, and the guy's ear got bit off. You know, like, I'm not a fan of that stuff at all. But metaphorically speaking, it's just like, we're weird over here, and we're not like all that stable, and so we're gonna kind of just mix weird shit, like, there's like these surfy guitar lines, but we're also gonna fucking throw a blast beat in and then spit in your face, you know? And where I feel like, uh, I don't know, the Strokes wouldn't do that, you know? No, I, I don't know. They just get high and make out with girls or screw girls or whatever. But I would rather like, which not a bad no 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 not at all strategy either. <laughs> not at all. Like, but here it's like we're just like what the fuck like we, you know like there's all this institutional racism and like look at like what the it's 2014 there's like all this shit in Ferguson with the fucking pigs like. Ah, like what the fuck, you know? And so you would expect that sort of delivery from an artist who who is aware of their surroundings, I guess. And then also too, we're gonna contemplate like parallel dimensions and how much our brain's working and the sun's dick and all this other stuff, you know. And we're like, man, like we will embrace all these elements and it'll come out in art in some form. Yeah. Well, I, from what I've heard, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. I like it a lot. <laughs> Thanks. In the uh, Retox music video, or one of them, you kill a, a pig. He was already killed. It, we're, you yeah. cut him open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was already dead, though. Yeah, cut him open. All right. And then he comes back to life, I believe, as a KK. KK For a guy who doesn't like metaphors. Yeah. 
And then, uh, it's pretty strong shit right there. Yeah. You can't. But you it also, it? like, I mean, I think MDC said the same thing, you know, they had cops are the clan. Yeah. So, no, I mean, uh, it, but it, yeah. I mean, Reagan Youth was all on board with that kind of shit for sure. And I'm not. I don't know. I mean, I'm pretty not into cops. For the most <laughs> part, you know, like, I'm trying yeah. to figure out exactly how to, like, not get arrested. But. Like, there, there's got to be good cops, and for a long time, part of me, and I just never could fucking force myself to do it, but I was like, I should be, like, I got arrested, I got arrested for possession of marijuana when I was 19 years old, in Chula Vista, had just left a house, had just fled a fucking house party that had been shot up, okay, so, we're at a house party, there's gunfire, we leave, we go and park in like this little, like kind of in front of this little real estate office that's right by the archway, which is this kind of iconic old bar in Chula Vista on Telegraph Canyon Road. We're sitting there, I'm not even in the driver's seat. It's my buddy Jesse and my buddy Duncan, polar fucking opposites. Duncan was hardcore like Republican at the time. My buddy Jesse is like full like La Raza Latino, wears fucking ponchos everywhere. And I'm like somewhere in the middle, like in the back and we're listening to like Art Bell just getting high and like having an argument. Sounds great. Yeah, it was a great, it's fucking awesome. And then, you know, there's a fucking knock on the window and it's this cop and he seemed kind of cool at first and he's like, are you guys fucking with the building? Like, did you do anything? He's like, cause the alarm went off. Like the only reason I'm here is cause the fucking alarm went off. Like, I'm gonna check it out. And everything's cool. Like a like, silent alarm, oh, yeah. so we didn't hear it. So he goes, checks it out. And he's kind of like, all right guys, I like, get out of the car. Like, but you know, like, like everything's still looking good at that point. And then like, <laughs> Two or three more cops come. And by the end of it, there's like a sergeant there. that There was literally seven cop cars for the three of us and a joint, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was getting fucking furious. Like, I, I, and at the time, you know, I'm younger. I'm not as good at holding my tongue. I don't know. I probably would still be furious. And I'm just like livid. And during the time that it takes fucking seven cop cars to come arrest these three kids that are fucking smoking weed. Seven? Seven cop cars. Taxpayer dollars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm watching dudes leave the fucking archway, like, bunging over curbs, like, wasted, like, seeing the cops and freaking out, and the cops are just, like, watching them drive down the fucking road, and I'm just sitting there going, you fucking cocksuckers, like, getting so mad, and so eventually the guy's like, oh, okay, like, you want to play it like that? We're going to impound your car, like, walk yeah. home, you know, so then I ended up making it way worse for myself, but, it, but I kind of came away with that going, like... Maybe I should be a cop. Like, somebody needs to be a good cop. Like, there has to be a cop out there that's not being a dick. Like, or else how do cops ever fucking change? Because they're not going away. That's the thing is, like, you know, there's always this, this defensive argument. Like, not all cops are bad. But, and, and I'll say, yeah, not all cops are bad. But a lot of them. But it's this, correct? But it's the system that, that they're representing, you know? And it's, it's the whole thing. It's rotten at the roots of the system. And that's that's the issue that people need to address. Because, you know, like, there's, there's like, funding... There's like all this fundraising happening for the fucking pig that killed the gentleman, the young man in Ferguson, and the guy won like he got like six hundred thousand dollars or something in donations in like a day for killing an unarmed human being. It's fucked up, and like yeah, that's one incident, one cop, whatever. But it is this sort no, of it's institutionalized. I, I, the message is almost like for other cops, wow, I better go out and shoot somebody so I can get 600K. I mean, there's a lot of messages being said, you know, and the thing is, I think the cops' days are going to be numbered. Everyone's filming everything. And like the Rodney King incident, that was like a drop in the bucket. That was the first time that the world got a glimpse of what the fucking pigs do. And it's like, yeah, you live in La Jolla, you live in you know, parts of Benzina, it's like, whatever, things are chiller no there. Idea. You live down here, or you live in the fucking barrio or in the ghetto, like shit's fucked up, you know? And, and even beyond that, like, you know, you think of like, issues with the border, the where the border patrol are, even like being in abandoned touring, like again, like, oh, you're, you know, you guys have drugs, like we're gonna fucking tear your shit apart and then leave you stranded out in the middle of nowhere, you know, it's like, I mean, it's crazy and, you know, like, my mom's been fucking beat, hogtied, thrown in jail, my grandma went to get my mom out of jail and they said, we're gonna fucking throw your mom and, you know, my grandmother in jail too and I'm like, dude, this is crazy and I was like eight years old at home by myself, my mom was fucking in jail because like, they were saying, oh, you're drunk and you're trying to get into this car. And she was getting into the same exact car of her own car. But, the, but like, you know, she tried to get into another Mazda 626 or whatever, same color, in the same parking lot. And they're like, you're drunk. And then she's like, fuck you. You know, I'm not drunk. Oh, you're going to jail. Hog tied her, beat her, threw her in jail. And that was it, you know. So it's like, I see that shit. Or like, like, let the little kid fend for himself. 
Dude, it was, it, I mean, I and and granted, like I'm I'm not a person of color. I'm fucking glad that I don't have to deal with oh, that shit. that added sense of fear. But it's the truth. It's the truth. When there's a cop around, do you feel safe or do you feel scared? Because I feel fucking scared. And the, and then it goes on to like you know even thinking about like when I was 16, 15 or sixteen, my first band. I mean, our, our drummer Jose was on the cover of the LA uh, LA Times, getting arrested by the cops, bleeding in his face and shit. And that picture went on the cover of our record. It's like. We fucking, I was a kid and I already hated cops, you know, and like shit has gotten way worse. Yeah. Worse. I feel like filming cops is kind of maybe our only saving grace. Dude, the footage point, I right? see though is just brutal. Like but, one in, the one guy just punching the woman in the same yeah. face, like on the side of the freeway. And you see that shit so much. And then, I mean, in the wake of Ferguson, like we kind of forget that there was the, um, the schizophrenic young man, like in Northern California mm -hmm. that got fucking beat to death yeah. fairly recently. And... I, you know, not to go too big picture on this because I don't know, you know, exactly where the line is, but like, in the like small amounts of research I've done, I, I, so much of it harkens back to kind of the decline of the sheriff's department and the police taking over the sheriffs because the sheriffs are actually voted on. So like the the sheriff of a county is at least there's some accountability to the people. Where these police chiefs, it's just like cronyism appointments. Then you have the fucking, then the fact that. Then the fact that somebody can profit off of a prison blows my fucking oh, yeah, mind. That is fucked. like, it's a great investment. And, advice, though. and then it's yeah, and, it, and it's just this fucking they this cycle of of guys with a chip on their shoulder that did a little bit of community college going into this fucking power struggle that's then funded by these bigger guys that need a bunch of fucking black people to fill their fucking prison so they can churn out fucking. I had I went to school with a kid and his dad was a fucking. Multi multi millionaire. You know what he did? He made the metal racks that have gum, like in magazines and shit. When you go to check out at Vaughn's, all prison labor. Paid these dudes eight cents an hour to fucking like powder coat and you know crazy fucking conditions. I'm sure like all this shit. And the dude made twenty million dollars a year off of fucking prison labor. And in a way, good for him. Fuck, he found, like, this weird loophole. But that should never even exist. Like, that shouldn't be a fucking option for private enterprise to come in and, like, profit off this shit. And then it's like, how do you... Ex it's like ticket quotas and shit. They're going to just keep filling that shit I mean, up. one thing if the, the prison labor was, like, rapist and, and, like, hard, you know, violent criminals. But you, you have the whole gamut of people. And, you know, they were saying, like, the, the largest percentage of people in... in in prison or in there for weird ass things, drug offenses and shit, like uh, non-violent offenses. Yeah, and I feel offenses. Like, that's the craziest thing. Or like the, and you even think about like the elderly, there are people in there that were that were locked up for drug, you know, possession or whatever, are serving like life sentences. Where that now, in this day and age, wouldn't have gotten that same sentence. So they should like kind of reevaluate. I think everybody in, in yeah. you know. There definitely needs to be some kind of reparations. What do you think, you know? And the guy was just like, all right, yeah. He let him move along. along. Yeah, like, it's like, wow. like, he was just to me, like, he didn't want it, he didn't want him talking anymore. He was just like, uh -huh. he knew there was nothing he could do that he was at a whorehouse, you know? So it was just like, just shut the fuck up and keep going. And I was like, I don't use that all the time now. Huh. That would not work for me. Hanging out with prostitutes, bro. What do you think? Like, yeah. So what's going on with the 3-1-G these days? I have to make that shift from the yeah, no, prostitutes and blow. Right. Um, I'll have to shift to anything from prostitutes and blow. <laughs> uh, I've never done those things. Um, a lot is going on. We got a new Doomsday Student record coming out. Um, a Warsaw Was Raw record coming out. We just released an all leather single. Uh, Hot Nerds album's coming out. But just a bunch of stuff. Um, then we're doing this 3-1-G tour in October. It's um, Retox, Doomsday Student, and Hot Nerds. And then in December we're doing a sort of a small California thing with uh, moving units, all leather, Kui, and Secret Fun Club. And all these are you know three pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Moving units have been around for a long time. They've yeah. been pumping stuff out. Yeah, they've been moving units. <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah, but <laughs> make new music at least. Um, and what did three one G release your book from the graveyard of the arousal industry? Yeah, it was a co-release with um, Soft Skull Press. I hear that's going pretty well. I think you sold out of at least one. Two. Two. Yeah, classes. it's weird. I tried to order some yesterday uh, for this tour, and they're like, yeah, it's sold out. So <laughs> they have to put in a new order and stuff. But yeah, it's good. 
that. So yeah. tell us what that's all about. How people can get that book once it's available. It, it's still there is still some uh, there still are some available on the Three G web store, and I think probably Amazon. The distributor doesn't have any, so whatever they send out to the retailers, I mean, I'm pretty sure you can still get it on Amazon right now. I just can't order 50 or something like I like I typically would order 50 and then take them on tour. Um, so yeah, you can still get it. It's an ebook as well, so you can get it. Um, on your Kindle, yeah, yeah. Kindle Fire, Kindle Fire HD. <laughs> with with yeah. your acting experience, surely you're thinking of doing an audiobook. I have thought about it a lot, but I, and the other thing is I don't have the time. I have all these other projects that I'd not rather do, but I think are more um, relevant or something. Because I think if I did an audio, it would be really funny. Um, but I've definitely thought about it. Um, it just hasn't happened. Why well, did you want to write a book? I did these tour journals um, f for uh, some publication a long time ago, and uh, I remember just kind of like sending one of them out when it was done to like my email list, like everybody, and like my friends, like, hey, look at this, this is what I just did for the last six weeks, and John Waters was like, you should write a book, and I was like, ha ha, like, yeah, right. right, and then, uh, and then so, he, you know, he was like, no, no, try it, you should write a book, and then uh, he's like, just write like a story, you know, one little story, so I wrote one, and and that was it. And then I and then I wrote like fifty more, and then made a book out of it, just little pieces. Awesome. Yeah. And again, I have like all these ideas. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna have been been working on this new book, which is about three one G, and I and I, I I kind of let it I might let it make it not a book necessarily because it was conceptually gonna be um, each chapter would be this sort of piece on the road on like each release so it, we're at like 75 releases so it's like a, kind of a lot to write um, but the main thing was each release would come with an interview that I would do with someone pertaining to that record and that was where my problem started because I couldn't get everybody through the interviews and then I just said fuck it um, <clears throat> so there's that and then I'm also talking about putting together this sort of, sort of yeah. I'm talking to him or yeah. something like yeah I was just it made me so pumped. Like, that, that was the thing, too, because I got, I, I got to go to the chain before I started playing music, and it definitely made, um, it blurred that line of, like, you're in a band, and then you're the fans. It was like, you're part of this community, and that was, that was how it was displayed, you know? Yeah. No, it makes it, it makes music real accessible, and I, like, I didn't go to the chain much when I was younger, and I know that there's been a lot of different incarnations, and, and it doesn't have the best of reputations now, and it, probably, and it never did with the security and stuff but like I went to Soma a lot growing up you know and I yeah I mean fucking like you hang out behind it then you go to Carl's Jr. with like this like crew of kids and you're just like out like kind of like causing what I would call like wholesome trouble like not causing tons of fucking trouble but like just out wreaking a little havoc like running around and like that was so important to me and probably less important to me